put it in your savings account. <coughs> that whatever you need, whatever you need, you take it from the Dutch savings account. In other words, it's like 401k. <laughs> that you put it in your retirement plan, when the retirement time comes, you take it from that savings. So that is what this is about. So we shouldn't forget ourselves because we all have the same journey to go, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qala Allah al-Aliyya al-Azim fi kitab al-Kirim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقٍ وَمَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ ذِنَّ اللَّهَ ذُو الْقُوَّةِ الْمَتِينَ صدق الله العلي العظيم This ayah is one of the ayahs that answers one of the great questions that every human being, regardless of your faith or your religion, you have to have the answer of these three questions. These questions are important to every human being. Because not having the answers of these three questions, the life is useless. They have the life has no meaning. These questions are so important to the point where Imam Ali alayhi salam He said in one of the hadith, Rahimallahu Mri'in Alim. God bless any soul. Any soul, male or female. Doesn't matter. Alima min ayin, I'll listen carefully to the scene of Imam Ali, it's beautiful. Min ayin, wa ila ayin, wa fi ayin. In our scholars, they call it, thalatha ayniya, three ayin. Ayin means word. Question of word. And all the questions, they are about you and I, our lives. And Imam Ali said, anybody, any human being, if you are able to come up with the answers of these three questions, I said, I have to offer you. Rahimallah. May Allah have mercy on you. What are the three questions? <coughs> Question number one. Rahimallah umra'an aliman min ayin. He said, God bless us all who found the answer of where was I before this war? Where was I? Before I came to this world that I found myself in, where was I? That's a question number one. There are any person who is able to find the answer of this question, Imam Ali said, Rahiballah, may Allah bless that soul. That is question number one. Question number two. Wafi ayn. Why am I here? I found myself here. But why am I here? Am I here to eat, drink, and that's it? Or I have a mission. I have a purpose on this planet. That is question number two. Question number three. Now, when I figure out why I'm here after this life, where am I going? Is the life is just about this world and that's it? Like some people, they believe there's no life after this after this life. All the life that we have to live is this world. As soon as you that that's it. There is nothing after that. Nothing about heaven or hellfire. Life is all about here. That is why they take every single advantage of this life. Anything they have to do to enjoy this world is all their focus. Because they don't believe in any life after this life. Now, these three questions, Imam Ali says, any person who is able to come up with the answer, he said, I make dua for them. Rahimallah. Rumra'in, Ali Mamin Ain, Wafi Ain, Wa Ila Ain. Tonight, I don't want to talk about the first one, because we already passed there. I don't want to talk about the one that's coming, because we are not there yet. I want to talk about the one we are here now, currently. Which is, why are we here? What is the purpose of me being here? And tonight, I don't want to go into saying yes, I just want to forget what the Quran says. 
about the purpose of us being here. The ayah I just read is the answer of that question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنِّ I, Allah, did not create jinn. By the way, there is one, another debate among our scholars. About who is the first one that Allah created? A human Allah created first? Or a jinn Allah created first? There's a debate among our scholars. Some scholars believe that, no, Allah created the human first and then jinn. Now some scholars say, no, it's the opposite. Allah created a jinn first and then after that he created human. And the reason is this ayah. Because the ayah said, وَمَا خَلَقْتَ jinn." I did not create jinn. Then he says, well, ends human. Right? But that's not a good reason. You know why? Because when you go to the Quran, there is another ayah. Allah mentioned insan first than jinn. There's some ayahs in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we created human being and then jinn. So that doesn't make a reason that a jinn is the first one that Allah created. But what's the answer? Who was who the one that Allah created? Is it a human being first or a jinn? The answer is simple. And the answer is human being first. Who is that human being? They ask Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, ma huwa awwal shay'in khalaq Allah. What is the first thing that Allah created before he created anything else? When there's nothing but Allah, then the Prophet said, awwal ma khalaq Allah wa huwa nuru nabiyyukum Muhammad. Allah. The first thing Allah created is the nur of Muhammad. And Muhammad is a man or jinn. The man. So let's clarify that the first thing that Allah created between the two, human or jinn, Allah created human first. Starting from the our Prophet. Now, then Allah SWT said, why did I create them? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ jinn. I did not create jinn. Well, ends or human except for one reason. What is the reason? He said, Except to wash it. Here are the two tafsir. One tafsir says, لِيَعْرِفُونَ To recognize me. <coughs> that Allah SWT said, that the purpose of creating all these people and jinn, Allah said, is to recognize me. Nothing else after that. But some people say, some tafsir says, no, as to serve Allah. But the word that is used is abd, لِيَعْبُدُونَ To worship Allah. Now tonight, I just want to elaborate the ibadah, the, the purpose of our creation on this universe. And then I want us, after the end of this speech, I just want us, I'm going to give some of the branches of ibadah in Islam. And I just want you and I, between you and Allah, figure out yourself which, which group are you in. Because, you know, we all know, mashallah, we have our own clubs that we belong to. But the clubs of Allah, we don't recognize ourselves which club am I belong to. Now tonight, I want to mention that there are different clubs Allah said through the Prophet that people worship Allah in these categories. Now, which one do you belong to? Now, then I'll tell you which one is the best of all. <coughs> if you are here, try to make your goal here and strive your way to that goal. That is number one. And number two, we're going to mention some of the mistakes we do too. In Ibadah, we all serve in Allah, but there are some mistakes we do. We want to find out those mistakes. And then we walk ourselves through that high level that we want. Now, this ibadah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, which is the highest purpose of every creature. Because ibadah that we're talking about, yes, the I mentioned jinn and humans. But when you go to the Quran, Allah said everything that we created in this world, their purpose is ibadah. You see the rotation of the sun and the moon? It's ibadah. The sun... The stars, the galaxies, everything, the cloud, the earth, the air, everything that you see, they all have one purpose, and that is to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the purpose. Everything that you see. But how did they serve Allah? Allah created them to serve Him, but through you. How? The Prophet sallallahu mm -hmm. he said, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create all these things? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered, Ya Rasulullah, wa sakhara lakum ma fi samawati wal ard jami'an min. Allah said, everything that exists in the heaven and the earth, I created to save you human beings. But then the question is, if everything is to save me, who am I here to serve? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, if this is clear, now let's come to the ibadah. The ibadah which is worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they come into different categories. Category number one. There is one ibadah is called ibadah to shakirin. That's the first one. That some people they look at the blessings of Allah to them, and then when they do ibadah, they don't care about anything. They focus. Allah has given me this and this and this and this and this. Now I deserve to say thank you to Allah Subhanahu. So every ibadah they do, the aim and the purpose is shukr, the thankful and being grateful to Allah. <coughs> Example, our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of them is our Prophet. Now you'll hear the history of the Prophet, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the middle of night he stands up for salat al -Layn. His feet was swollen. His wife, Said to him, Ya Rasulullah, you have been given heaven. There is no question about it, Ya Rasulullah. Heaven is guaranteed for you. Nothing to worry about. Why do you have to put yourself in all these troubles? Salat, fasting, hajj, zakat. That was the answer of the Prophet. The Prophet said, Shouldn't I be a grateful servant? That upon all what Allah have done for me, I have to be a grateful servant. That the ibadah that I do is not because I want heaven or hell. I just want to be a grateful servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is one part. Now in the same line, one of them is <coughs> Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam. Prophet Sulaiman in Surah al Saba, he says the same thing. When he says, Rabbi awzi'ni an ashkura ni'mataka allati an'amta alayhi. Ya Allah, let me be among your servants who constantly they find your blessings and they thank you for those blessings. That is called Ibadah to Shakiri. That the focus of those Ibadah, those servants, is to see how much blessing Allah has blessed them. And they have to return their gratefulness to Allah. That is category number one. Number two. And that too is called Ibadah to Muhibbeen. Muhib. They are not focusing on thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, they are in love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't care about anything you talk about, about a hellfire, about heaven, about this. No, no, no. They are in love of Allah. They don't care about anything in this world other than the love that they have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Example, Imam Ali alayhi no. salam. No. When you read the Al-Kumail, pay attention carefully. You find some part, Imam mm. Ali is referring to this part. What did he say? He says, Ilahi sabartu ala harrinari. Ya Allah, I can be patient on your hellfire. Meaning, if Allah decided to put me in the hellfire, it is fine with me. فَكَيْفَ أَسْبِرُ ala فِرَاقِهِ but Ya Allah, how can I be separated from you? The love that I have for you, I can't go away from you. No matter what you do for me, what you do with me, I say it's okay. As long as I still have you, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Allahu Akbar. That is called Ibadatul Muhibbi. They have the love for Allah. Another one is Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura, when he looked at the group of people who are in front of him, and he said to them, Ilahi taraktul khalqa turran fi hawaq. Ya Allah, I'm leaving the entire creatures, the entire people behind me. And he said, Fi hawaq, all in your love. Wa'aytamtul ayal, and I'm keeping my children 
to become orphans. I'm letting my children to become orphans. لكي أراك so I can see you. فلو كتعتني يا الله if you decided to cut me into pieces, I say فما ما لت الفؤاد إلى سوى. Even if you choose to cut me into pieces, my heart will not go to anyone but you. Because the love that I have for you is never going to go anywhere. It's just for you. That everything that I do is nothing but out of the love of Allah Subhanahu. That is group number two. Now, I don't know if you find yourself in the first one or second one. Maybe if you're not in the Shakirin, you are among the Muhabbin. Now, if you are not among the Muhabbin, that is the third one. Which one? Hmm. It's called Ibadatu Haya Allah. The third group, they are doing Ibadah to Allah. But their Ibadah is they feel shy. Child of Allah. What, child, what does it mean? Meaning those people, whatever they want to do, they always compare the, gra the, 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 the greatness of Allah and those favors of Allah upon them. And then they look what they are doing to Allah. And they say, I haven't done enough for Allah. And I feel shy of myself in front of Allah. One of them is Luqman. Luqman, alayhi salam. He said that everything I have done for Allah, I stay, he said to his son, he was telling his son, he said, my son, he mm. said, worship Allah in a way that even if you bring the entire good deeds of the universe, he said, you know that you haven't done enough because his favor on you is always more than what you do for him. That man, he said, that ibadah that I do for Allah is always I look at myself and I feel shy because no matter what I do, no matter how much good this I do, it's always less than the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I feel shy of Him. And this is very important, brothers and sisters. Because this, if you put this in mind, it helps you to stay away from sin. Why? Because. Every normal person, a decent person, think this way. That if somebody does favor to you, what do you have to do in return? At least do favor to them. No, I didn't do favor. Should I return with the bad deeds? No. Here, Luqman alayhi salam, he wants to tell us that. That's why he saw his son in the hadith. He said, my son, anytime you want to do something that displeases Allah, think about his favor that is around you. And... If you decided to sin, he said, go ahead, go ahead and decide the sin. But I ask you one thing. Leave his earth and go to the earth that does not belong to him and sin as much as you want. Allahu Akbar. It's at least feel shy that Allah has provided me all these blessings and in return I have to sin. That is called ibadah to haya. They do ibadah, but their focus is they always feel shy. From all that things Allah have done in return of what they have do, what they do for Allah. That is number three. Number four. It's called Ibadatul Tujar. I think most of us fall in this category. Ibadatul Tujar, the Ibadah of businessmen. <laughs> businessmen. What does it mean? It means they don't do something, whether it's ibadah or anything, unless they know how much they're getting back. Like a businessman, when they go to buy something to sell, first what do you think? How much does it cost? How much money I can make in that item that I'm buying? So when I buy and I sell, I know how much profit I'm getting. These people ibadah to to job, before they do anything, first they pause. They think, okay, now Allah said do this, what am I getting, Ya Allah? Am I getting heaven? Okay, how much? Is it the highest level or the, the middle? If the, uh, the ibadah is going to take me here, then I'm going to... But if he's here, forget. Ibadah to Tujar. The businessman. They don't do unless they're getting something. And inshallah, I'm going to elaborate this on more. And because this is one of the biggest mistakes. Even some of us, unfortunately, <coughs> and got to the point that when we do the ibadah, we take some ibadah, we do them, and then we put in our mind, see, I have done A, B, C, D, and so inshallah, I'm guaranteed, I don't have to worry about anything. Inshallah, the key of heaven is in my pocket now, I have nothing to worry. Inshallah, Yom Al-Qiyamah, heaven guaranteed. 
These are the people, businessmen. That is one of the group of them. And I don't know if you are in or you are in the first or in the second or the third one. But that's most of us. That our ibadah is nothing but based on we are wanting something from Allah. We want, we want profit from Allah. That is group number four. Group number five. They call ibadatul abid. Abid, the service of slaves. They are slaves, but they are slaves of the slave. They are slave of Allah first, but they are slave of other things as well. <coughs> who are those? The ones who worship Allah because they are scared of something. Hellfire. They know Allah SWT said, if you do A, B, C, you will end up in the hellfire. Now, if Allah didn't say that, they will have been different people. And this is most of the people ask also, even in the daily life, in our social life, we fall in that category. If we were those of us who drive, if they said today there is no cops on the street, no red light, no cameras, anything you do is not going to count on you. No point on your driver's license. And you see how people are going to drive. It's going to be different driving. The reason why people are always careful, because what? There is cameras. Mashallah, if you see some people when they drive, they look. Okay, on this street, I think there's a camera before. I got a ticket here before. We're careful. Not that we're supposed to obey the law because it's good for us. No, no. The reason why we always focus on trying to obey the law is because we don't want to end up getting ticket or we don't want to get up into jail. And there is nothing about what? Being a good citizen. No, that doesn't count. Now here, these people, the same thing also in the ibadah. Their ibadah is not about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their ibadah is not about anything other than because they are afraid and they don't want to get into any problem. That is also category number five. Number six. They call them ibadatul mutaladhidin. Ibadah of people who find pleasure in serving Allah. They have special feelings when they start to pray or to read Quran or to talk to Allah. They find a different pleasure. That pleasure cannot be compared with anything. Communicating with Allah is the best communication with anybody else. That is called mutal. They find some different feelings. I give you an example in the Quran like Musa alayhi salam. It's one of them. Musa alayhi salam he has a beautiful communication with Allah that when the communication starts, he doesn't want to stop. Because he enjoys it. One, he's doing the Quran. Allah asked him, وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى Ya Musa, what is in the hand? And Allah knows, but Allah is asking, that is in your hand? What is in your hand? What is it? The answer would be, a stick. But Musa didn't stop there. He says, my stick? alayha. I lean on it, and I use it to uh, direct my animals and control them. Not only that, I said, and I have other purpose for using this stick as well. Allah, one question. It could be women, one answer, but it kept going on and on and on because he enjoys that communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of me, they have that pleasure. When they talk to Allah, when they do ibadah, they have special pleasure. They have special feelings between them and Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that feelings cannot be compared with anything else. That is called ibadatul mutaladideen. They have special feelings. That is another ibadah. Another ibadah also is called ibadatul arifin. Or ibaratul or rafa. Arif is singular, or rafa is plural. Those who recognize Allah. This ibadah cannot be compared with anybody. Ibaratul arifi is, is the best one, boys. Arif is the one who recognizes Allah as he should be recognized. Those group. They said, they do an ibadah. Their ibadah is not for any other reason. Their ibadah is for one sake. What is the sake? 
the sake is they found Allah deserving one to be saved and that's it. Allah Akbar. They say we don't want heaven, we don't want hell fire. All we want is we found him, he is the deserving God and we're supposed to serve him. That's it. And that's what the Imam Ali Ali Salam says. He says, I Allah. He says, Allah. I serve Allah. La tama an li not because of his heaven. Wala khawfan min nar, not because I'm scared of his hellfire. Wala kin wajadtuhu ahlan lil ibadati fa abadtuhu. I found Allah the most deserving one to be served, and that's all the reason why I'm serving. That is the highest goal. Mm -hmm. That is should be the ultimate goal of every moment. If I find myself in any one of these categories, I should try and swipe myself towards this level, which is the ibadatul arifin. But here come brothers and sisters. I just want to focus on what I just mentioned, ibadatul tujar. Ibadatul tujar, a lot of us, we make a mistake. What is a mistake? We found one kind of ibadah, and we think by doing that ibadah, we say we're done, that's it. For example, I'll give you one other example. We have some mu'min. They said that all I have to do is what? Well, to do certain namaz. There are two rakah namaz with ayatul kursi 141 times and dhikr 120 and this and this. And I do that dhikr and as soon as I'm done, that's it. I'm saved. That's one group. Some group, no. They said the, all I need is to do what? Is to have the love of Ahlul Bayt. Even if I don't do namaz, I don't do anything, that's it, I'm saying, Yawm al heaven is granted. That's another group. This is wrong, brothers and sisters. There's no such thing in Islam. But even if this is true, even, let's say this is true, this is right thing to do, but you know what is more important? There are three components we need to understand tonight. One is this. In Islam, action is important. There's no doubt. What we do is important. That's why in the Quran, anytime Allah says, Alladina amanu, you hear wa amilu as You have to act based on your faith. Actions are important. But there is something more important than the action. What is it? It's your intention for that action. Why I'm doing the action is more important. But that is more important than the action. So the action itself is good. But if the intention is not good, the action is nothing and it doesn't mean anything to Allah SWT. That's why in the hadith the Prophet says, Niyyatul Mar'i, the niyyah, the intention of a man, is better than the action itself. That is one component we have to understand. Now, number two, sometimes I do the action, the intention is good. But that is not enough either. Why? Because sometimes I might do the good action. But if I do something, it can destroy that good action. Meaning? See, sometimes building a house is one thing. And sometimes after I finish building the nice house, nice location, nice of everything, then I put explosion in that house. What happened to that house? Is gone. I built it. It's there. But what happened? One of actions, I can destroy the entire action. And the same thing the Prophet told the Sahaba, the companions, when he went to Isra and Mi'raj. The Prophet said, I saw a lot of you have houses over there. Because when you say, Subhanallah, heaven. Subhanallah, another house. So then one of the companions, Ya Rasulullah, I should have billions of houses there. The Prophet said, Yes, you do. But with the condition, if you don't destroy them. Your building is there, but one action, because brothers, we have to understand, sometimes we do the action, it's good, but one sin can destroy the entire years of your actions. And that is what we have to keep in mind. So don't look at, I have done A, B, C, D, look at, did I do something to maintain those houses and keep them running? That's what is important. Example, look at Shaitan. Shaitan, how many years we heard he said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The narration from Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says he served Allah 6,000 years. And Imam Ali said, there is no clarification whether years that we're talking about here, is if it's the years of Akhirah or this war. It 
doesn't matter. Take it in these years. These are years of this war. 6,000 years is not a joke. That you were serving Allah. But what happened? One sin, not two. One disobedient, everything was gone. So what do we do about that? Don't ever keep in mind, don't I have done this, I have done this. So I'm saying, no, look, did I do anything to destroy? Because one thing we have to understand, and it's mentioned in Islamic logic. They say everything, everything in this universe, they have two important things they need. Everything. One is called, al al mujida is the cause of existence. And two is called, al mubqiyah the cause of maintaining. Example, there is a cause of having a child. I can plant a tree. Now I plant a tree. I'm the cause of finding the tree. But there is another cause that the tree needs to maintain and give it the water and give it a good environment for it to grow and become tree someday. So planting itself is not enough. The other cause have to be there. So when we do ibadah, we shouldn't look at I do what I did. No, look at did I do anything to destroy that ibadah or not? That's the component we have to we are missing most of the time. And on top of that, there is one ayah Allah clarifies in the Quran where He says, "Man jaa bil hasanati falahu ashwa amdaliha." This ayah is amazing. See, most of the ayah, man amil, whoever did. But the ayah, Allah said, whoever brought with him. That the ayah, did not say, man amil, who did? No, man jaa bil hasana. He said, yawm al qiyamah, when you bring with you one good deed, Allah says, falahu wa ashru amthaliha. Then we'll multiply that one deed to ten. But the ayah is used, who brought with him, not who did it. Because doing it is one thing. But sometimes you lost it in the middle of the road. Sometimes some people, they do the action, but right at that place, they lose the action. How many hadiths we have? The Prophet said, Kam min salah min musalli. How many people they do their namaz? as said, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Then the angels, they wrap the prayer, they say, take your salah. How many people, the Prophet says, they fast, they didn't eat from dawn to sunset. At the end of the day, the Prophet said, this is nothing but hunger and thirst. How many would have been to Hajj? They do the Tawaf. They went between Taw and Safa and Marwa. They went to every place that we're supposed to go in Hajj. But then Imam Jafar al Sadiq says, he said, they are not Hajjij, they are Dajjij. <coughs> Hajjij is the Hajj, the one who Allah accepted the Hajj. Dajjij is, they just were uh, charting. That's it. They were just making some noise, but they're not Hajjis. Others are saying, Labaik, Labaik. Others are saying something else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in some of the, uh, the hadith, there are some people in Hajj, they say, Labaik. And then the answer say, La Labaik. Mm. Yes, I responded to your call. And said, No, we didn't even call you. <laughs> they did the Hajj, they did the everything. But the aim is, their action was not being able to maintain. That's one of them, it's one of the component that destroy your action is what? It's real. A lot of us, we have done the Salah, we have done everything. But if the intention is for other people, that is a Yawm al Qiyamah, a person comes Yawm al Qiyamah and they give him his book as he takes the book and looks and you see that none of his A'mal is recorded in there. Then he asks, Ya Rasulullah, I have done this, oh yeah, angels, I have done all this, this, but it's not recorded. Then they say the intention was not for Allah. You did it for people, go and get your reward from people. So the most important, brothers and sisters, is that when we do any amal, try to maintain that amal and protect it. That is what is more important than the amal itself. That is what is important. So don't look in your ibadah that I have done this, I go and count it, what you have done. Because some of us, mashallah, they say, I've been to Ziyarah seven times. Okay, good. I have been to Hajj 16 times. I have done Salatul Layl all my life. I have done this, which is good, Alhamdulillah. May Allah give you the sawab and give you the strength to continue to do the amal. But the point is, how much have you done to protect those amal? Sometimes I can have money, I work and earn it. But how much did I do to save and protect that money? If I work and I put it on the trash, is the money going to be there tomorrow for me? 
or if I do work and I put it in the safe place, then I can get back to it anytime I want. The same thing our Aman. Our Aman, when we do it, the most important mm. is to protect that Aman. That is what is important. That is why you see Ahlul Bayt السلام, they emphasize about this. That whatever you do, make sure that you protect your Ahman. Any actions <laughs> without protection, it doesn't mean anything. Now come to Ahlul Bayt السلام. On the day of Ashura, didn't we see there are two groups? One group where the group of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, one group where the enemies of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and remember they both do salat on that day. They both did salat? That Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he led the salat al Maghrib and he shot with his people. And Umar ibn Sa'ad did, did salat too. But where did the two salat is gonna go Yom al Qiyamah? They both are called salat, but definitely one of them is not accepted. But the amal is there. Why? Because Allah is not mm -hmm. going to accept any deeds that was already done after the killing of the son of the prophet. They did the deed, but then they brought the explosion to destroy that deed. Mm -hmm. The deed is there. So the most important that I want us to leave tonight is to mm -hmm. always be careful after you build something, maintain it. And that is what I said, even during the time of Ramadan, when we go and we do sacrifices, a lot of, in Ramadan, no sleeping, reading Quran, dhikr, dhikr, and then salat on the day of Eid, Allahu Akbar, that's it. As soon as we finish Salat al Eid, it's like we are not different people. It's not like the same person who was doing Salat al Eid. It's not the same thing like the person who was doing dhikr. Then the entire 30 or 29 days of ibadah is destroyed with the bad days we call enjoyment of that. That is what is important, brothers and sisters. So the a'mal is good, but what is more important is to protect that deen, to protect that Islam, or that action that we have done between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But other than that, that action itself, it has no value in the sight of Allah without being protected. You go to Ahlul Bayt salam on the day of Ashura when Imam Hussain salam looked at those people, those enemies of Allah. And he called them. And he said to them, Ya Mahshar al Qawm, oh you group of people. He said, Who is there in the world beside me as a grandson of the Prophet? No one. And he tried to call them to maintain their actions that they have done, but they were not able to do that. And they found themselves uh, the people of hellfire, not because they didn't do the action, but because they destroyed the actions by killing the grandson of the Prophet. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to maintain our actions, Ya Rabbi al Ya Allah, whatever we have done, even as small as it is, Ya Allah, help us to protect those A'mal, Ya Rabbi al Whatever we will do to destroy our A'mal, the good deeds that we have done, Ya Allah, protect us and save us from doing so, Ya Rabbi al Ya Allah, any shortcomings that we have done, whether we do it intentionally, or, in, or, or not intentionally, Ya Allah, forgive us, Ya Rabbi Al-Alameen. To your marhumin and all marhumat, rahimallahu man kara al-fatiha ta ma'as salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Any question? Yes. Yes. Any questions? Yes. Question? Yes. Yes, brother. Yes. You mentioned Ibadah to Tajar. I mean, this is common that you ask for some favor from Allah and you say, I will fast or I will offer so many lawful. Is that something discouraged or encouraged? I mean, the question is, sometimes we ask Allah, we say, Ya Allah, I want this and this, which is called in Arabic, in fact, it's called nadar. Nadar is to bow to Allah, that Ya Allah, if you do this, this for me, 
I will also do this for you. It's the fastest or help and need. You know what is funny in this? There are certain people when they do the another, there are two ways of doing it. One, most of us will say, okay, yeah, Allah. Like for example, if you help me get the job, I'll fast two days. Now we waited until we get the job, then we fast. Right? Here they said, this is lack of trust in Allah. We waited because I said to Allah, okay, I ask you to do this, right? Okay, if you do yours, okay, I'll do mine. If you don't, then don't expect me to do my y'all. That's what I mean. But you know, Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, when they do nadr, they don't wait. As soon as they make the niyyah, the next day they start their a'ma, their part. They leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because why? Because they know if Allah did fulfill or did not, it's always at their own benefit anyway. Because what I ask, sometimes I might ask something is not good for me, but I don't know. Sometimes I ask something is good for me, but maybe the timing is not good for me. So what Allah does, I do another with Allah, but Allah says, yes, I'm not going to give you right now, because it's not good for you. But they're going to do their own part as well, waiting for Allah. If he does, alhamdulillah. If he doesn't do, alhamdulillah. But in either case, whatever you do is fine. And trust me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't buy, it doesn't, it's not haram or it's bad thing to do the to job. That's fine. But that's one of the lowest level. It's like kindergarten, right? You know, kindergarten, those who teach kindergarten, they know that what do they do? They reward them before they do their homework, right? You put a sticker on their paper, huh, mashallah, I get two stickers, three stickers, then they come with their homework tomorrow. That is us. Right? I do my namaz, Allah says, okay, you have Jannah, there is a drink in there. Say, okay, Allah, tomorrow I'm going to do my namaz. Then when they say, okay, there is another drink in there. Then you keep going. That is fine, there is nothing wrong with that. But that is to let you know that that is the lowest level of Uqtaad. But that's fine, there is nothing wrong with that. Yes. Um, can you um, think we're talking about salah. Mm. Uh, yes. So, the continuity of doing the wudu, mm. then making the niyyah for the salah, and then mm. you do the salah. So, so, help us understand the purpose and the wisdom and the logic and the mantak behind doing the wudu, and how is it connected to the salah? Is there, mm. what, what's the wisdom, and has this always been in existence? Yes. <coughs> the question is, <coughs> what is the relationship between the wudu and salat. That when we make wudu and then salat, how do they connect to each other? Salat is the purpose is purification. Purification is the purpose of salat. When the Zahra alayhi salam in a khutbah, when she discussed about every action that we do in the in Islam, why do we fast? Why do we go to Hajj? Why do we do Salah? When she answers, she says, وَجَعَلَ لَكُمُ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْزِيهَا لَكُمْ Allah prescribes Salah to purify us. Now, every human being is created in two parts. One part is called physical part. The other one is called internal part. Now, in those two parts, we need to purify ourselves. I need inside purification. And I need the outside purification. Now, although what it does, it serves one part of purification, which is the outside part of purification. When we wash our hands, wash our face, wash the arms, there is puri uh, purification of the outside. Even though it has a relationship with what? With also inside as well. Although, then the salat itself. It also have another purification which is internal in purification. That's what the Quran says about Salat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar. That Salat, what it does, it purifies those illness and diseases in your heart that it helps you to stay away from eat from the bad things. On top of that, when the Prophet describes Salat, he says, Law kana ala babi ahdikum nar. If any one of you have a swimming pool in their house, and he or she swims in the swimming pool five times a day. The Prophet said, question to you, would the person be dirty after five times of shower? 
Es el no. Es el salat, es la cena. Salat and the wudu is a shower you take. How many times? Five times a day. And that five times a day, if it's done properly, not ever salat. No, no, no. Not a gym. Because there are two kinds of salat. One is gym, one is real salat. Gym means you go Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. You go down outside, that's gym. You go exercise. You might lose some one pound or two pounds after the end of the day. But that has nothing to do with any purification. But then there is another thing called Salat. Which is what? Which is when a servant of Allah disconnects from everything in this world and is able to connect with his creator. And that's what Allah Akbar is. Takbirat al-Haram, you disconnect with everything and then connect with your creator. That is the Salat that we're talking about. If that wudu and the salat is done properly, that is what gives you that proper purification. Yes. Okay. Yes. My voice is not working, so <laughs> sorry for that. One question is that can a good deed be actually a sin? For example, somebody is reading Quran, reading the translation, reading the tafsir, but one person is reading it to find something in, in it to create a mischief in the Muslim mean. Yes. Another person is reading the same thing for the purpose of debating or making somebody feel lower than him because he knows more. Right. Another person is reading it to really understand and learn and do what's written there. So between the three, all are reading the same ayat, same tafsir, can one be a sin, the other one could be a good deed? Yes, absolutely it's obvious. When three people, in the category that brother mentioned, three people, they all doing the same action. They all read the Quran, but the intentions are different. The first one, I'm reading Quran to understand, so I can also feel arrogant on the others that they don't know. That is one. The second group? No. I'm reading Quran, but the purpose is I want to go and, mi and misguide people with it. The third one? No. I want to read the Quran, not only to do all these two things, no, just for myself. But I'm going to add one more. I learn for the sake of learning. That is also sin. I learn, but I'm not using what I learn. It's a sin. Actually, no, Yom al Qiyamah is going to be another increase of punishment on the person. And I can give an example. A lot of our majalis is like that. We go there, we sit down, we listen, right? I heard it, but we don't practice what we learn. In Islam, we are not supposed to learn for the sake of learning. We're supposed to learn for the sake of improvement. That's why when we go to any place and we hear something, I have to take even one thing, one thing, and apply it in my life. But if I go and I listen and it goes out of here, or I listen, I don't practice, that itself is a sin. Because number one, you wasted your time. That time is very important. Asr, Allah said, I swear by the time, time is very important. In the hadith of the Prophet, he said, Yawm al Qiyamah, nobody will cross the Sarat unless we ask them four questions. Question number one, mm -hmm. and your life, or we're going to ask you about your life. How did you spend the life? Did you learn something? You didn't learn something? What did you do when you heard about this? Did you apply it? You didn't apply it? That's what's in the house, some of our scholars. When they go to house and they learn something, they sit home for weeks. Why? They say, I don't want to go and learn something that I'm not able to apply and then the day of judgment, I will be held accountable on that. <clears throat> so whatever I have, let me practice that first and then learn something extra. That is how David this is. So yes, sometimes certain action can be good by itself, but the intention can turn it to become a sin. And not only that, it be counted as a great sin as well. Yes. Good questions. Yes, please. 
Uh, it's related to Vadu. Um, if you're taking a shower and then uh, it's time for Salat, can you do Ghusl instead of Vazu and then do your prayers? Yes, you can, but you cannot do that Ghusl to become enough for Salat. No. There are two kinds of Ghusl in Islam. There is one Ghusl that is sufficient for Wudu. The second one is not. The one that is sufficient for wudu, they say, is ghuslul janaba. Janaba is enough. But in other ghusl, like in this situation, no, I'm running for the salat, so I have to run. No, that is not enough. You can do the ghusl, that's fine. But that will be counted as enough for you to do the salat. So even after I do ghusl, I have to redo another wudu for my salat. One more question. Uh, moderation. Is, what is the definition of moderation in Islam? Because a lot of people who consider them moderate Muslims, their definition of moderation is, I'll do the good deeds and I'll do the minor sins also. So I'm moderate, I'm balanced. Is that a good definition? I mean, is that... <laughs> oh, we only have one Islam. <laughs> we don't have moderate Islam or other name. No, we have one Islam, that's it. And that Islam is to obey Allah and stay from away from sin. Whether it's a major sin or minor sin. Doesn't matter. That's a Muslim. So saying that no, I'm gonna be moderate so by doing sins, that doesn't make you a moderate. That makes you what we call a sinner. Don't look at the sin as it's a small sin. Like the Prophet says, and Imam Ali also say the same. He said, don't look at the sin and say, oh, this is a minor sin. No, no, no. He said, look at the greatness of whom you are disobeying. Disobedient is what is the factor here. It's not about small or minor. No, what is small or a major. What it is is the sin is still disobedient to Allah. Whether it's a major or minor. And that doesn't make you any moderator. But what it does is to make you a sinner. So we don't have that in Islam. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned earlier that uh, not applying knowledge is considered as to be a sin. Yes. Did, now, did you, did you specifically mean that only in terms of Islamic knowledge, or what if like, you go to school, you learn something new, but would we be asked in that day, uh, did you take this knowledge and spread it among your community? Like, did you do anything good with your PhD or your master's degree? Would you, is, is that uh, is that an area that will be accounted for? Yes, when we say in the knowledge, knowledge is anything that you know. And Imam 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 Zain al Abidin salam Allah He said that everything, in everything, every form, that's a there's no exception. He said in everything there is a zakat to pay. <coughs> He says, and zakat of knowledge, means whatever you know, is to share with the others who don't know what you know. It doesn't matter, it's not about wudu or salat or Quran, no. If I know, let's say for example, I'm good in computer, and I know somebody needs it, then I should share that knowledge with them. I know anything that I know, it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be Islam, it doesn't have to be anything with the Quran or Hadith, as long as it's knowledge that can be useful to anybody, I should put it into use for others. Not using that is considered sin. Unless if there is nobody is in need, that's different. I have it, but nobody needs it, then I'm not responsible. Because the Prophet says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't make learning wajib upon anybody until it made it wajib upon he who knows to share with the one who doesn't know. I mean, Allah tells you, who knows, it's what you to share. Before he tells it, you go and learn it. So it's the responsibility that whatever I have, I have to share with others in that. But doesn't yes. that conflict with trade secrets? I'm sorry? <laughs> you don't tell everybody about your trade secret. Your, like your you secret? Trade secret. I'm sorry. Something that you know about a business, yes. that's your information. Yes. That's a secret for your business. Mm -hmm. You don't want to share it with others. No, we have two kinds of what you call secret. There is one that is personal. That's different. As long as you say, go share your business with people. And then there are things that others can learn to benefit from it too. That is different. That's what we're talking about. 
Even in Islam, Allah says, it's not allowed for others to go and search in other people's secret. No, keep your secret for yourself. Islam says, I'm not, I'm, you're not supposed to share everything that you have, what is happening to do with your secret. And I'm not allowed also to go and spy on you to know your secret. No. But we're talking about something that knowledge that should be public use that I have, and I'm not sharing that. Yes. Yes, brother. Yeah, very important question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what about those uh, Muslims, those, uh, those who say, like, I'm Muslim, but I'm not practicing? Like they are two different types, practicing Muslim and non-practicing. So what about those Muslims? Yes, you have, mashallah, you have those, a lot of them. Some people they say, Islam is personal. Right? My relationship with Allah is personal. Allah knows that in my heart, I love Him so much. So even if I don't do my namaz or prayer, that's good. I said, okay, you can think as much as you want. You can describe Islam as much as you want. But at the end of the day, Allah is the one who describes Islam because it's His religion, not you or mine. Right? And I'm giving this example. I said, if it's your birthday, any person who takes that way, if it's his birthday, right? And I want to do something to please you, right? What do we do? I ask you, what do you like the most, right? What can I do to make your birthday? Good birthday. Then you tell me I like cake. Then you tell me I like card. Then you tell me I love gift cards, right? So I got you a gift card. And then you are happy that I give you something you want. But if it's your birthday and I say, no, I don't care what you think. I'm going to go to Walmart, pick up anything that I want, but you have to be happy with what I want. So, okay, it's your birthday or my birthday. If it's your birthday, okay, good, buy anything you want. But if you want to please me, you have to go the way I want, not the way you want. Now, Islam is Allah's religion, not you, right? And in Quran, Allah says, if you are a Muslim, Islam based on two things. One is the faith and the action. Right? Based and faith and action. And amazing, those people, mashallah, they're so smart. And everything, every film, there is always two things. One is theory and practical. Right? When you go to learn IB, there is a theory part and then there is practical. A doctor you want to become, there is a theory part and then there's practical. Even among our lives, right? Among ourselves, as a husband and wife, you tell your wife, I love you, honey. Right? She said, okay. I know you love me, but what? I don't want to take you out. I'm not going to buy you anything on your birthday. But I love you. Allah knows in my heart. I love you so much. And I'm not going to buy you flowers. But Allah knows in my heart. I love you so much. So good. You can take that love to anywhere you want to go. But I have nothing to do with that love. Because if you love me, show me practical. I want to see something. Now you tell Allah, I love you, I believe in you, but I don't want to do the namaz. You can take that love to any way you want to. Allah says, I don't have nothing to do with that. So that is Allah. 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 Allah.